Here on the ground, change happens fast. Problems feel frequent and urgent. It's loud and anxiety runs high. From a satellite view, the Earth looks the same as it did thousands of years ago. We've been here before. Let's learn from our past and shoot for a better future. Hello and welcome to A Satellite View. I'm Todd Mickelson, your host. You may have seen the movie Lincoln. Oh man, it's getting older now. It might, might even be like 8 or 10 years ago. It was about passing the 13th Amendment. It was during the Civil War, toward the end of the Civil War. It's a really interesting movie to watch. First of all, it's a really good, well-done movie, and the depiction of Abraham Lincoln is amazing. And the uh, depiction of the time period is really fun to be into as well. One of the interesting things was that when Congress was arguing about passing the 13th Amendment, now keep in mind that there was nobody in Congress from the South at that time because they were down in the Confederacy. So this is all Northern Congress people arguing about the 13th Amendment. And one of the things they said was, if we allow black people to vote, the next thing you know what they're going to try and do is allow women to vote. So, <laughs> so actually, these guys were more afraid of women getting the vote than black people getting the vote. You know, it just shows you where things were at. So you've probably been hearing, that was the 13th Amendment, you've probably been hearing then about the 14th Amendment lately. Right after the Civil War, some of the southern states that had been part of the Confederacy began to send the unrepentant former Confederates, like Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy. They were sending guys like that to Washington to be senators and representatives. Congress refused to seat them and drafted Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And it says that any who violate their oath to the Constitution are to be barred from public office. Section 3 disqualifies from federal or state office anyone who, having taken an oath as a public official to support the Constitution, subsequently engages in insurrection or rebellion against the United States or gives aid and comfort to its enemies. Of course, Southerners strongly opposed it because it meant that they couldn't be in Congress because, you know, they, they engaged in an insurrection and a rebellion. <laughs> now, this does not say you need to be convicted of or it needs to be proven in court that you were part of an insurrection or rebellion or, by the way, giving aid and comfort to its enemies. Now, Trump went to a fund, he spoke at a fundraiser or like kind of held a fundraiser at his golf club in New Jersey. And the purpose was to pay some of the January 6th people's legal fees or something. You know, it just went into Trump's legal fees, but he said it was for the, some of them were great patriots, great patriots. And he's promising to pardon them if he gets to be president. Is that not aid and comfort to the enemies? These people were convicted. It was proven in a court of law that they engaged in an insurrection. That was the actual title of their indictment. And then conviction. I mean, it's, it's already been proven. Not in the court of law, but it's been proven that Trump, at the very least, gave aid and comfort. It, he also clearly <laughs> supported the January 6th. I mean... We've heard so much information with the January 6th select committee. We know that he engaged in an insurrection. Going through some things that we forget about. January 6th, 2021 was the insurrection. On January 10th, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, formally requested representatives input as to whether to pursue Section 3 disqualification of outgoing President Donald Trump because of his role in the January 6th United States Capitol attack. January 11th, 2021, Representative Cory Bush, who's a Democrat from Missouri, and 47 co-sponsors introduced a resolution calling for expulsion under Section 3 
of members of Congress who voted against certifying the results of the 2020 U.S. presidential election or incited the January 6th riot. Those named in that resolution included Republican representatives Mo Brooks, Louis Gohmert, and also Republican Senators Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz, who objected to counting the electoral votes to certify the 2020 presidential election. There's more information about Ted Cruz participating even in the planning of the fake electors. Audio tape of him on a phone call talking about this whole plan that people are now being indicted for. Why is Ted Cruz not indicted for it? I think he may be someday. Again, Watergate, the attorney general went to prison, but it was five years after the crime. So this stuff takes time. I don't even think I was aware of Cori Bush's uh, and 47 uh, co-sponsors, nearly 50 members of Congress, wanting to expel Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Mo Brooks, Louis Gohmert. Also in 2022, I do remember this, after Representative Madison Cawthorn, if you remember him, he punched the crap out of a tree once to try and prove how big and strong his arms are. After Madison Cawthorn declared his intent to run for re-election in 2022, a group of North Carolina voters from Cawthorn's district filed suit, alleging that a speech he gave immediately prior to the Capitol attack incited it, and that therefore Section 3 disqualified him from holding federal office. He got taken off the ballot. He was disallowed from running again. There was a similar challenge, which a federal court declined to block, was filed against Marjorie Taylor Greene. So the federal court said, yeah, go ahead and uh, get rid of Marjorie Taylor Greene, too. It didn't win, but all of these things happened. So now, you may have heard a couple weeks ago, two prominent conservative legal scholars, very conservative, they're active members of the Federalist Society, they wrote a research paper that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment disqualifies Donald Trump from being president as a consequence of his actions involving attempts to overthrow the United States presidential election. Also, conservative legal scholar J. Michael Luttig, he is extremely highly regarded as a conservative judge and expert. He and Lawrence Tribe, they concurred and wrote an article together arguing Section 3 protections are automatic and self-executing, independent of congressional action. Luttig explained the reasoning during television appearances subsequently. So a court may be required to make a final determination that Trump was disqualified under Section 3, according to some legal scholars, but according to Luttig and Tribe, no, not so much. And these other very, very conservative people. Another thing that happened, Somebody brought suit. Let me get to that page here. Yeah, Robert Davis is urging Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson to declare that under the U.S. Constitution's 14th Amendment, Trump is prohibited from appearing on the ballot next year. He filed a legal challenge. Davis argues that Trump's role in the January 6, 2021 riot, his repeated attempts to overturn the election, and his continued financial support for people charged in the U.S. Capitol attack amount to engaging in an insurrection or rebellion. He says, It is quite clear that not only did he engage in an insurrection, but he also aided and comforted those who either pled guilty or are currently charged in the insurrection. In the challenge, Davis points out that Trump attended a fundraising dinner. Yeah, okay, we talked about that already. The Secretary of State of Michigan is Jocelyn Benson. She's the one who's charged to make this decision because that's how it works in Michigan. Some states you got to get signatures to get on the ballot. Some states you got to do other things. In Michigan, the Secretary of State has the ability to say, no, you're disqualified from being on the ballot. So that's why this guy filed suit, basically charging her. And he says he wants her to make a decision within 14 days. And I think he put it up on the 29th. So we're still within that 14 days. By the way, I'm speaking at you from Saturday, September 2nd, 2023 in the space-time continuum. Forgot to say that at the beginning. 
Now, what Jocelyn Benson has been saying about this, first, she emphasized her plan to consider the issue exclusively based on applicable law without partisan considerations, expressing concern that this issue could become weaponized in future elections. Secondly, she said she was consulting with her counterparts in the states of Georgia, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, and perhaps others as well, to increase the basis on which this kind of decision will be made according to the law and without partisanship. She keeps repeating that. She also noted, as others have said, that any decision that a Secretary of State makes on this issue will not be the last word, but will be challenged in court, leading to an eventual appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. That is very likely so. I don't know that there's time left, especially, you know, I I don't know what cutoff dates are for uh, secretaries of state making such a determination. When is the final ballot? Does it have to be before the primaries, for instance? If Trump wins the primaries and they say he can't be on the ballot, then there's no Republican to choose from? I don't think it'll work like that. So there are still a lot of questions, but I've been surprised over the last week how much more this is being talked about. It seems like it's getting legs, you know? It seems cut and dry to me. We've seen the evidence. We all know about the indictments. There's also litigation about this in Florida, kind of a similar type of thing, somebody putting up a legal challenge in Florida saying that he should not be on the ballot. And also in New Hampshire, the Attorney General's office is carefully reviewing the legal issues involved in this same thing. Bryant Mesner, an attorney and prominent Republican who ran on Trump's endorsement in 2020 for running for Senate, he has publicly questioned Trump's eligibility to run for president, citing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Of course, other Republicans are trying to fight against it. But these are all Republicans who are saying this. Jocelyn Benson is a Democrat, but legal scholars, very conservative Republicans. And in New Hampshire, it is a Republican who brought this up. It's a Republican who ran on Trump's endorsement in 2020 is saying, no, Trump cannot be on the ballot. There were even rumors that uh, Scanlon's office, he's the Secretary of State, I believe, yeah, Secretary of State David Scanlon of New Hampshire. There were even rumors saying that he had already made a, a decision on this, and he made sure people realized he has not yet made a decision on this. He's still analyzing it. Neither the Secretary of State's office nor the Attorney General's office has taken any position regarding this in New Hampshire, they're saying. So they want to keep it open. And also, in the uh, grand juries, it's all Republicans that are testifying. These are all Republicans. How can Trump say all these people are wrong? They're, you know, he can't, he can't blame it on the Biden regime. These are all Republicans who are saying this about Trump. So, yeah. We're going to take a short break and come back and talk about some more very interesting developments that are going on. But I just am really, really surprised at how strong the talk is about the 14th Amendment and disqualifying Trump. It's really amazing. All right, we'll take a short break and come right back. You're listening to a Satellite View. September 2nd, 2023. Big hurricane just hit Florida. 
and <laughs> DeSantis is. I I just think this is kind of kind of vile, really. There's a headline that says Biden won't meet DeSantis in Florida during tour of hurricane damage, but in reality. Though President Biden said earlier on Friday that he would see Ron DeSantis on Saturday, the governor's office said there was no plans for a meeting because he's a big baby and he's scared that it's going to hurt him the same way that Chris Christie got hurt when Obama went to New Jersey after that huge hurricane back in 2012. I kind of get that, but it's the president of the United States. Chris Christie stood up to the Republicans and said, come on, it's the president of the United States. Of course, I'm going to meet with him. He's coming here on behalf of my state. Of course, I'm going to meet with him. Whereas DeSantis is a you know, big crybaby. No, I, 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 got, I only got one pair of, of ugly white boots to walk around in the water with, and I'm not going to give one of them to him and just have only one shoe on. He can go get his own white boots and walk around in a different place in the water. Such a baby. Oh, by the way, too, he's pulling out of a few states as far as his ground game, door knocking. He says it's because of strategy, but it's because he's running out of money because nobody will give him money anymore. He had a huge war chest, and now he's running out of money. John Eastman, he's uh, indicted in the Georgia case, he went on Fox News and basically said, yeah, I pressured Pence to uh, not do what he was supposed to do on January 6th. Yeah, he basically went on Fox News and said, this indictment? Yeah, of course I did what I'm charged with doing in the indictment. So <laughs> throwing himself under the bus, kind of like that Monty Python show where, oh my God, he has ran himself over with his own car. John Eastman uh, throwing himself under the bus. There's a parody Jack Smith account on Twitter, or whatever you want to call Twitter now, which, by the way, I'm using it way less than I used to because it's kind of starting to suck more and more. I, I, any day I'm expecting it to just be blinked out, so I probably should get on other platforms. But anyway, there's this parody Jack Smith account on Twitter, and the guy says, I'm afraid all these people are going to convict themselves before I have a chance to get to them. <laughs> Seems to be what is going on. A very important thing down in Georgia. The judge has ruled that, yes, television cameras can be in the courtroom. Also devices. Now, this is a very important development because, first of all, a lot of reporters... And lawyers work on their devices these days. It's the 21st century. Some people work paperless, you know? And that's encouraged. But they can't bring their laptop or even their phone into the courtroom. So they got to print out papers. Seems pretty absurd. Now I'm talking about federal. That's in federal court. And there's more and more talk of that being changed. And I think that this development in Georgia is going to kind of break open the dam. And I think we're going to lead to having all hearings televised. And that's extremely important for many reasons. If it's not televised, you know that Trump's lawyers are going to find the nearest microphone outside the courtroom and lie about what happened in the courtroom. They're going to say, oh, the prosecution really messed up. They're really losing. We're, we got this slam dunked. And they're going to lie about what was said and what was not said. And possibly then even sway the results in a way. But certainly cause more outrage with the Magat people. So the Magat's got to have access to see what actually happens. What actually was said in court. As it is right now, we get transcripts days later, and then you got to read the transcripts. And you know, Magots are not going <laughs> to read the transcripts, but they might watch it on TV or streaming or something. Even after the fact, they might watch clips of it or something like that. And then they can kind of go, wow, this guy's really a jerk. I, th I thought I liked this guy, but no, wow. Yeah, he, he should be going to prison. That's one reason. Section three of, uh, or number three, the 18th United States Code 5771, subsection three. That's what it is. All this 
legal jargon, but it's called the Victim's Bill of Rights. And in this case in Georgia, well, in all these cases, the voters are the victims here. All of us, the, uni- the people of the United States are the victims. And all of these cases with insurrection and the, the documents, Mar-a-Lago case, all of this, in the Victim's Bill of Rights, it says that the victim absolutely has access to the courtroom and seeing what goes on in the courtroom. Well, we can't fit 333 million people in one courtroom, so we need to televise it. We need to have cameras in there. That's another important thing. And another really important reason to do this is we got to see what we're doing to our own people through our justice system. You know, a lot of people are thrown in jail who should not be thrown in jail. What if we could see their trial? You know, I I think there would be a lot less unfair rulings and unfair prosecutorial malpractice. It couldn't happen anymore (laughs) if there were cameras in the courtroom. Imagine some southern small courtroom where the judge is racist, the prosecution is racist, everybody is racist, except the black guy who just got caught with weed in his glove compartment. Throw him in jail for 50 years. That would not be able to happen as easily. (laughs) I say as easily because a lot of people down there watching it on TV would say, yeah, throw him in jail for 50 years. He's black. But um, you know what I mean? It's much more of a monitor on our justice system, which is under scrutiny for good reason right now. So, yes, we need cameras in the courtroom. We're going to have cameras in the courtroom in Georgia for this mass 19 co-conspirator trial, including Trump. Very doubtful that Trump will take the stand, but I could see Trump insisting. He's already making his lawyers do very unreasonable things in the courtroom. I could see Trump insisting. I could see Trump being in the courtroom with the agreement with his lawyers that, okay, no, I won't take the stand. And then him just standing up and walking to the stand. You know, he, he doesn't uh, listen to anybody and he thinks he knows everything. And I would imagine he thinks, if I can take the stand, I can get myself out of this, you know? <laughs> so, I don't know. I, a lot of people are saying there's no way Trump is going to take the stand. I'm not one of those people. I think there is a chance he might take the stand and... Having that on TV? Oh, my God. It'll be the most watched. It'll be like never seen the most watched TV show ever. Because that's all he's thinking about. How could I have lost to Biden? I have so many more people come to my rallies. Biden doesn't throw rallies because we're not sycophants. He doesn't sell as many T-shirts as I do. I I sell the most T-shirts. The most more T-shirts than probably any president, including Abraham Lincoln, including Lincoln. Your favorite president sells the most T-shirts of of any president in history. Not even George Washington sold as many T-shirts as I did. So how could I have lost the election? I sell the most T-shirts. I have the biggest TV shows. Yeah, that's not how it works, dummy. Yeah, cameras. (laughs) I can't wait. I I mean, it'll be extremely interesting to watch all of these people. Uh, John Eastman, (laughs) uh, Jeffrey Clark. Wow. It's going to be a poop show. The feces will be flying. And by the way, Trump is acting extremely extreme. He put out like 31 little video clips in a few hours, I think two days ago. And they're crazy. They're absolutely crazy. He's going nuts. And his makeup application is getting worse. And his hair is getting more Flock of Seagulls-like. And he's getting more sweaty. His angry face is getting angrier. And he's just going absolutely crazy. And, by the way, further incriminating himself with every word he says. I have made the official prediction on this show, on this podcast, that I don't think Trump is going to be the nominee for the Republicans in 2024. By the way, his business fraud case goes to trial on October 2nd, and there's no way he can get out of that. That's going to put the Trump organization out of business. 
He's got that on his mind. Magots will see that, that how much of a crook and cheater he is in his business. The greatest businessman, the art of the deal. Nobody makes deals like me. Yeah, you're a horrible business person, and you should have been put out of business for fraud decades ago. But now, because you wanted to run for president, now you're getting caught with all this stuff. Again, the the victims in that are the New York people of New York, the law-abiding citizens of New York. And Trump was withholding tax money from being contributed into the state by cheating. Fraud. It's a fraud case. It's very serious. He's going to have to pay $250 million and probably more. It's going to put him out of business, and it's going to disallow the Trump organization from doing business in the state of New York. That's on his mind, and that's happening in a few weeks. Also, the Georgia trial starts on the 23rd of October, possibly at least. I would say probably some of the people are going to start a trial, some of the 19 co-conspirators. They're scheduled to at the moment. They requested to. That trial could end before primary season, possibly. Now, I know the primaries in Iowa start just insanely early just because they want to be first. So I think that starts on 15th of January. There's another trial beginning the day before Super Tuesday, and that trial will very possibly end at least before Election Day, and possibly, and I would say probably, even before like May, even before it's spring and summer. And sentencing might happen <laughs> before Election Day, and it might put Trump in jail. And that's on his mind. So another thing, he's 78 years old, I think. The anxiety and amount of stress that he's demonstrating in these videos. For a 78-year-old who eats poorly and is possibly obese, I don't know, he could very well die before next summer. Stress is what kills you. Stress and anxiety for a 78-year-old who eats extremely poorly, drinks a lot of diet Coke, and is very much overweight. I don't know. What if he did die? The Magots would blame it on Biden. <laughs> Even though Biden is totally incoherent, he has the power to make Trump die magically. That's what they would be saying. Some sort of conspiracy. Or else they'd be saying, he didn't die. He just escaped and is hiding. He outsmarted everybody. He outsmarted America. He outsmarted the... And by the way, it seems like they kind of are against America now and, and are even admitting it. Now, I talked to a friend of mine, a really close friend, and he, he listened to my last episode and called me and we were discussing things. And he pointed out, you know, I'm just getting so sick of being mad at these people or thinking these people are idiots or thinking they're bad people. I'm just getting sick of the division. I'm getting sick of feeling this way. I don't want to hate people. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I was thinking about that same type of thing, but he really made me think even more, even in the realm of that they're human beings. We're all human beings. It's really hard for me to think of these Magat people as being human beings, but they are human beings. That's a conundrum that I, I really do want to put more effort in thinking about, talking about, and I think I ended the last podcast by saying we got to take care of each other through all of this. Get out, take a walk. Don't let the stress kill you. <laughs> I think my friend is making an excellent point, and all of us need to try and figure out how to handle this. It leads, again, to something I talked about a few episodes ago. There are a lot of people who were in the Republican Party who certainly are not Trumpers. What about those people? They're fighting against us. We're fighting against them. That's not how it should be. And I think that's what my friend was talking about. And we need to talk about that more even on this podcast. That's a subject matter that I think needs to be talked about in the United States because I, both my friend and I agree that 2024 will likely and hopefully be an end to this era that started in 2016 that just really got us against each other, even though the Magots are in the vast minority. Very, very few people are like that. 
but they're all still human beings. And then other Republicans, we've got to still figure out how to coexist. What's going to happen? The Republican Party is going to just be decimated in this next election. What's going to happen after that? It's kind of like the Civil War. It's going to be Reconstruction. It's kind of like we're in the Civil War now, and we're going to have to have Reconstruction. It's like we talked about at the very beginning of this, the 14th Amendment was part of Reconstruction. Very complex but interesting subject of the whole Reconstruction, and I think we're going to have to have a Reconstruction of our society again after the results of 2024. Yes, way over time here. Made you sit in your car. You reached your destination, but then you had to sit in your car because you could not get out of your car before the podcast ended, right? So, sorry to delay you, (laughs) but uh, just so much to talk about. We'll see you next week on a Satellite View. been listening to A Satellite View with Todd Mickelson. Go to toddmickelson.com for links and more information.